In this video, I'm gonna give you the best possible photo settings for the Canon EOS R10. I'm gonna go through and explain every photo setting on this camera and then recommend what I think is best for each situation. This is gonna be a long and in-depth video, so go grab some popcorn, feel free to skip around, go back and forth, pause, anything you need to. And lastly, if this video helps you out, please consider dropping a like and subscribing. But I'm not gonna waste your time anymore. Let's hop right into the settings. All right, let's go ahead and hop into the menu and get started. So in this video, we're gonna discuss this page right here, which is this little camera picture. And then there's 10 different pages inside of this one single tab. So we're gonna go through all 10 pages of this camera tab here because these are essentially what have to do with the image quality itself. The rest of these tabs don't have much to do with specifically the image quality itself. There are a lot more personal preference type of options that you can go through and set depending on what you need the most. So let's go ahead and get started. First of all is the image quality. So let's go into this menu here and there's a bunch of different options. These can be very confusing, but I'm gonna give you a couple different options in terms of the best settings for the image quality. So first of all, if you wanna shoot photos and you don't plan on editing them, you don't plan on putting them on your computer into Photoshop or Lightroom or something like that, and you know, editing them further and adjusting all the colors and exposure and contrast and things like that. If you don't plan on doing any of that with this camera, then what I would do is with this raw option, set it to off, which is just that little line right there. That means you're not gonna shoot any raw photos, which I'll explain what those are in just a second. And then down here, what you're gonna to wanna to do is set this at L. So this is the JPEG L, which stands for large. This is the highest quality JPEG option. So the reason I'm shooting JPEG with this is because that is the best option for just exporting your photos from your camera right onto your phone or computer to upload to social media or to email or to text to someone or to just keep in your photo albums or something like that. So again, if you don't wanna edit your photos, you just want the highest quality picture straight out of the camera, I would set raw to off and then set the JPEG to this L right here. However, if you plan on taking photos with this, importing them into a photo editing software like Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One, something like that, then what I would recommend is actually doing the complete opposite. So setting RAW to this RAW right here, this is the highest quality RAW option. This C RAW right here is actually a compressed RAW, and so it's gonna be smaller file size, it's able to get more photos on your card. However, it's slightly less quality than just the regular RAW. So for this raw setting, I would go over to the middle option right here, which is raw. And then for the JPEG, I would actually go over to this line right here. And so that means you're only shooting in raw. So raw and JPEG are both different types of photo formats. And like I said, JPEG is really good for straight out of the camera images. But when it comes to adjusting exposure, color balance, and everything like that on your images, Shooting in RAW is a lot better because it captures all of the data from your image sensor. So it's a much larger file size than the JPEG. However, it holds just so much more data inside of each image that when you do some crazy adjustments with it, it won't just break down and turn into a really low quality image. Like what can happen if you really push a JPEG file? JPEGs just really aren't meant for pulling and pushing your colors as much as RAWs are. And then finally, there's a third option that I recommend, and that's if you don't really know what you wanna do with your images, you know, you don't know if you wanna edit it further or just upload it to social media right away. And for that, what you can actually do is select multiple at once. So you can select your raw format, which we're gonna choose this middle one, that's the highest quality. And then we're gonna go ahead and choose this right here, which is the highest quality JPEG. If we press set on there, you'll see right there is raw plus L. So for every time you take a picture with this camera, it's actually gonna take a raw photo and a JPEG photo of the same photo. So you'll have two identical photos every time you take one, which means it'll take up way, way, way more card space, but it's gonna have both of those photos so you have that option later on to edit the raw photo or just upload the JPEG to social media, or again, text it, email it, do whatever you wanna do with your photo. Now, personally, I edit all my photos in Adobe Lightroom, so I just shoot in RAW specifically. But again, those are the three best options for file format. Next up, dual pixel RAW. So this is actually a really neat option. What this does is it takes different pixels from your sensor. So Canon with dual pixel autofocus actually has a second pixel for every pixel on the sensor. However, what it can do is actually use those pixels to take a photo with those as well as the ones next to it it merges the pictures and creates like a, a much higher resolution image because it uses double the amount of pixels to create this image. Now there's a lot more limitations with this in terms of file sizes and how many you can actually take. It takes time to store each photo afterwards. Of course, since it's 
double the resolution. It's gonna use a lot more data and a lot more of the processing power of the camera. Next up, still image aspect ratio. So this has to do with, you know, the aspect ratio, the width versus height of your image. However, the only one I'd recommend using is three to two. This uses the entire sensor. The other options are actually gonna crop in on the sensor a little bit and pretty much just get rid of image data. So I would recommend shooting in three to two all the time, but then after we shoot your photo, if you need to, you can easily adjust the aspect ratio on your phone or on your computer or really anywhere. But I would recommend shooting in three to two to get all the image data from the sensor in your photos. All right, next up, let's go on to page two. So this is exposure compensation. So essentially if you're in an automatic mode on this top dial here, in the automatic mode, in the scene mode, aperture priority, shutter priority, anything like that, exposure compensation essentially allows you to tell the camera whether you want it to be a little darker of an image or a little brighter of an image, or you know, right at zero exposure, which is a perfectly exposed image hypothetically. Next up, ISO speed settings. So this has to do with your ISO speed. So if you don't know what an ISO is, I would recommend looking into it and looking into the exposure triangle, which is aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. They're essentially the three most important things to understand and know when it comes to manual photography. But either way, this sets your ISO speed. So, you know, of course, the higher the ISO, the brighter your image is gonna be, but also the noisier and grainier and worse looking your image is gonna be. So like always, I recommend shooting in the lowest ISO you can while still getting a correct exposure on your image. Because of course, a grainy image is still gonna be better than no image at all, or one that's so dark you can't even see anything. So again, try to keep your ISO as low as you can while still getting a correctly exposed image, of course. And then this right here, ISO speed range, essentially you can set the minimum and maximum ISO that the camera will allow you to use. And then this is the same thing except for auto ISO. So when you set it to auto ISO, this is the minimum and the maximum that you're allowing the camera to go to. And the minimum shutter speed, that's pretty self-explanatory as well. Um, you can actually set the minimum shutter speed the camera will go. So if you don't want a super long exposure blurry image, which can happen if you have a really slow shutter speed, you know, you can set it to be a minimum shutter speed of, you know, 1 60th or 1 1 25th or, you know, a half a second or something like that, just so that in an automatic mode, the camera won't go to a super, super long exposure photo, which can ruin images a lot of the times. Next up, HDR shooting in HDR mode. This has to do with high dynamic range photos. So with HDR photos and videos, the camera essentially takes multiple exposures for the same image. It takes some that are darker and some that are brighter. So then what it can do is merge those images together and essentially make something that is really evenly exposed. Nothing's way overexposed or way underexposed. And it just looks a lot more neutral, but can sometimes look slightly unnatural. Like sometimes when you take a picture with your iPhone, you know, everything is so flatly, perfectly exposed that it just doesn't look realistic. Because of course, in real life, there's gonna be really dark parts and really bright parts of everything that you look at. Now, when it comes to HDR photos, again, this is something that you can definitely mess around with and don't take everything that I say 100%. You know, don't set your settings exactly 100% how I do, even if you don't wanna set them like that, just use this as an outline. But I personally don't shoot HDR photos. I find that I can do everything I need to in Adobe Lightroom after shooting a raw photo and adjusting everything how I want it to. If you do set this to HDR, it will give you a much more evenly exposed photo. And if you're just shooting JPEGs, just shooting out of the camera, and you don't wanna edit your photos at all, I would recommend shooting in HDR. Next up, auto lighting optimizer. So this is similar to HDR where it kind of evens out the lighting a little bit. It kind of dims the highlights and raises the shadows just a little bit to give you a better looking image straight out of the camera. Personally, I keep this off as well. And then next up, highlight tone priority and anti-flicker shoe. I keep both these off as well and I really just would recommend keeping these off and don't even worry about them. And now let's move on to page number three. All right, so flash control first off. I personally, again, I don't use the built-in flash on these cameras. I find it to just be in a bad spot. You know, having the flash right in front of the lens is gonna give you super flat lighting. And personally, I just never use built-in flashes on my cameras. However, if you do wanna use the flash to just brighten up your images a little bit, of course, again, it'll give you a better looking image than having just a pitch black image. But I just find the flashes give you that like disposable camera look that you're probably used to with no shadows on the face, just a washed out image, you know, kind of like those disposable camera pictures. However, if you do want to use the flash in the camera, the standard settings are pretty good. You can kind of adjust these to fit what works best for you. Um, but I personally haven't even really went through these because I've personally just never really used the built-in flashes on my cameras. 
Next up, metering mode. All right, so the best way to kind of explain these different metering modes is essentially what metering does is it looks over the image on your screen in an automatic exposure mode to essentially tell, is it bright? Is it, is it too bright? Is it too dark? Is it perfectly exposed? And it just, you know, adjust the image to be as well exposed as possible, which of course it should do in an automatic mode. But with these metering modes, you can actually adjust what the camera looks at to find the correct exposure. Evaluative metering essentially looks at the entire image and finds what it thinks is the best exposure overall throughout the entire image. So there might be some things that are a little too bright and some things that are a little too dark, but since it's looking over the entire image, it's always gonna be pretty decent. It's gonna be almost spot on. Even if a few things are a little over and underexposed, it's gonna do the best it can looking over the entire scene. But then when you go to partial metering and spot metering and center weighted metering, these are actually gonna locate in on specific parts of the image to find the correct exposure. So if we go over to center weighted, that's pretty self-explanatory. There's a box in the center of the screen. It'll only look at that. So if there's something on the edge of the screen over here that's way, way, way overexposed, you know, it's not even looking at that. So that won't even matter. That can be way overexposed and this can be way underexposed, but whatever's in that box in the center is gonna be perfectly exposed. Same with spot metering. This is a spot you can move all around. Um, and essentially whatever's on that direct spot will be perfectly exposed, but everything else the camera won't even look at and it won't even care about the exposure of. And partial metering uses just partial spots on the screen to find the metering. Um, again, when you choose any of these, it'll actually show the spot on the screen where it's gonna be metering from. So you'll know kind of where the camera's looking at. But with evaluative metering, it just looks over the entire image. And that is what I personally choose. All right, next up, page number four. So white balance, this essentially, as you can see actually right here, it changes how warm or cool the image is. And so you can see what these are, daylight, shade, cloudy, tungsten, fluorescent. So essentially these adjust how warm or cool your image is. And you're kind of supposed to use these to make the most neutral looking image. So, you know, if there's a white light, you kind of select whichever one makes that white light look white in the camera. Cause sometimes it can be totally different. Like right here, everything looks blue. That's not how this looks in real life. I mean, that looks way more blue on here. However, if these were tungsten lights, it would look completely normal. Now for me personally, I either set this to auto white balance where the camera adjusts it automatically to do what it thinks is best. Or I just set it to daylight. And since I'm shooting in raw images, it captures every single white balance option in every photo. So you can pretty much just adjust it whatever you want to in your editing software. So because of that, when I shoot raw photos, I typically just set it to daylight balance because that's what normal lights you know, are at least close to, so I don't have to do too much adjusting. It's kind of right in the middle there. And honestly, most of the time I don't even need to adjust the white balance. So with this, I'd recommend either setting it to auto or just set it to daylight, and then you can adjust it if you need to in your editing software. And then custom white balance, this is where you can actually set your own specific custom white balance based off a photo. Um, so you can use like a white balance card or a gray card to get the perfect color balance for your exact lighting setup. But again, if you do that, as soon as you move to a different location, even turn the camera around or something like that, it could be totally different. And then for white balance shift, that adjusts the green and magenta tint of your white balance, which is kind of just another part to it. But if your photo is a little bit too green or too magenta, that's what the white balance shift is for, is to kind of just cancel that out. Next up, color space. This one's really simple. Just keep that at sRGB. That is the most common color space, the most widely used. I wouldn't even think about it, just set it to sRGB. Then for picture style. So what this kind of does is adjust the saturation, the contrast, the sharpness of your images. Now the thing with this and also um, shooting creative filters and clarity, these three actually aren't affected by raw photos. So with these three, if you're shooting raw, it doesn't really matter. But if you're shooting JPEG, I typically set this at just standard. This is kind of a minimum amount of adjustments. It just, it looks good straight out of the camera. It's just a standard photo. But of course you can go through these, you know, fine detail is gonna be a little sharper, maybe a little more contrast. Neutral is gonna have a lot less contrast. It'll be a lot more of a flat image. Monochrome is black and white. You can of course make your own and kind of adjust it how you want it to. Again, you can mess around with these, see what looks best to you personally. Um, but I just set it as standard. Clarity I set as zero, that's kind of a different type of sharpness. So if you want your photos to look a little more clear, a little more sharp, maybe a little bit more contrasty, you can turn this up. And then creative filters is kind of just a different type of picture style, but these are more along the lines of like 
Instagram filters or something like that. So I can go through these. This has grainy black and white, soft focus, fish eye effect. These are kind of more extreme filters. Again, they're kind of like Instagram filters. All right, next up onto page five. Lens aberration correction. I would turn this on if you have the option. Essentially, if you have an electronic contact lens, you know, a Canon lens or something like that on this camera, typically these lenses will have profiles built in that adjust some of the image characteristics of it. So let's say this lens has some vignetting issues, you know, from the factory. Instead of increasing the cost of the lens and, you know, changing whatever formula they have for the lens to get rid of that, what manufacturers do is just build in these corrections that kind of go into your cameras and they can go into your editing softwares as well. And they like automatically adjust that digitally to get rid of those issues. And so if you have the option to turn this on, I'd 100% just turn on. I mean, it's really gonna do nothing bad for your image. It'll just correct any issues that your lens might have. Next up for long exposure noise reduction, I personally keep this off. Um, however, if you're shooting JPEG straight out of the camera, I would just turn this on. It's gonna get rid of some of the noise in your long exposure photos. And it's just something that if you don't do it in an editing software, you might as well have your camera do it for you. Now, same thing with high ISO noise reduction. I think I forgot to mention it with the other one, um, but these two aren't really gonna be affected with raw images. With raw images, all the data straight out of there, all the noise and grain is gonna be in your images. So it's, these are just options you'd normally do in an editing software. But if you just shoot JPEGs, I would recommend turning these on just right in the middle option. Um, you know, it's gonna work the best. When you turn it to high, it's really gonna make the images a lot more mushy, even though it'll get rid of all the grain. I think, um, you know, when it's too mushy and gets rid of too much of the grain, it looks worse than having a little bit in there. Next up for dust delete data. If you have dust on your sensor, you can kind of do this thing in camera that gets rid of it digitally. I've never actually done this or messed with it, so I really don't know how it works, honestly. However, there is something in the software that can like get rid of those little dust specks on your sensor, um, you know, if you can't get it off yourself, which I'd 100% recommend always, you know, just removing the dust yourself, get a sensor cleaning kit, keeping your sensor clean. That is the most important thing for the longevity of your camera. All right, so next up, page six. So all three of these are kind of similar options. And so multiple exposure, this is an option in the camera where every time you take a photo, the camera will take a, a less exposed photo, a normal exposed photo, and then a slightly overexposed photo. And then what you can do is take those three images in your editing software of choice and merge them together to get this HDR-like photo. It's essentially like an HDR photo but it doesn't do it automatically. It just gives you those three different photos to use to kind of create your own HDR photo. And the next up, raw burst mode. This is kind of a little gimmicky way to shoot really fast burst photos in raw, much faster than you'd normally be able to with the camera. Now, I think instead of the, I think it's around 14 photos per second this can regularly take, which is pretty solid, you know, for action and sports shooting, being able to take that many pictures every second. But what this does, I think it does it electronically, and it can shoot up to 30 raw photos per second for a short amount of time in this like cropped lower resolution mode. Personally, I wouldn't recommend using this. This camera can shoot pretty fast on its own. And I think the drawbacks in resolution and it crops in, and it doesn't use the actual shutter of the camera's an electronic shutter. So the images are gonna have a lot more distortion to them potentially if it's a really fast moving object. And either way, these three options are honestly really more geared towards personal preference in your situation, something that you should mess around with and you know, experiment with on your own terms rather than someone that you use all the time because they're kind of specific types of options. But I'll go over focus bracketing real quick. This is essentially really similar to multiple exposures where you can set your focus on one thing and essentially take a picture, it'll move the focus a little bit, take another picture, move the focus a little bit, take another picture and so on and so forth with however many different you know pictures you want to take. So essentially, if you want every single thing in your image to be exposed, all the way from a really close up to your image to really far away, typically that's impossible. There's really no way, even if you have your aperture set to like F22 or F32 or something like that, everything's still not gonna be perfectly in focus because there's technically only one single focus point, you know, at one given time. So this will just go through, take a bunch of different pictures with different focuses, and then you can merge them in. There's a lot of automatic merging, you know, softwares. It'll just merge everything together so everything is perfectly in focus. 
So next up, page number seven. Drive mode, this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, single shooting, if you press the shutter button down, even if you hold it down, if you press the shutter button, it'll take one picture. High speed continuous plus is the fastest high speed shooting mode. So if you press and hold it down, it'll just shoot as fast as it possibly can. Um, you know, for as long as it possibly can, essentially before the card fills up or before the buffer fills up and it needs to stop for a second. High speed continuous is the same thing, just a little bit slower. Low speed continuous, you know, an even slower but continuous. So if you hold it down, it's gonna keep taking pictures over and over and over. And these are just self timers. Those are again, very self explanatory. Next up, interval timers. So this will actually be for recording time lapses. So you can set an interval. So every however many seconds or minutes or whatever you wanna set it at, you know, let's say every three seconds, it'll take a picture and then it'll take however many photos you want as well. So every three seconds, it'll take a picture until it reaches a hundred photos or 500 or, you know, it can go forever unlimited until your card fills up. And then bulb timer, this is a different option actually on this top dial. What bulb does is essentially, it won't have a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second or three seconds or even 10 seconds. It'll actually leave the shutter open until you specifically tell it to stop. So you can take images for like, minutes at a time, it'll just continue to let in light. Next up, silent shutter function. So essentially when you take a picture, I'll go ahead and take one right now actually. I don't know if you'd actually hear that because I have a directional mic pointed towards me, but when you take a picture with a camera, you know the typical camera picture sound, the shutter firing on the camera. If you turn this on, it'll actually be perfectly silent photos. You won't hear anything when you take a picture. So if you're in you know, a really quiet event, you know, something like that, this is really useful for having a quiet camera, not distracting anyone, you know, not getting kicked out of a place for all these shutter firing sounds. Next up, release shutter without card. This is pretty self-explanatory. If you turn this on, you can still take a picture without an SD card. It just won't save the picture. It'll only be able to take one, then it'll go away. I actually turn this to off so that every time I try to take a picture, if there's not a card in there, it won't even let me. So then I'll instantly know I don't have an SD card. If I turn that on, you know, maybe I take a picture real quick. I hear the shutter firing and I might have thought it stored the photo. If I'm not looking at the screen and I'm just, you know, quick taking a picture, you never know. Maybe it isn't in there and I'm just taking pictures. I'm not seeing the, you know, thing on screen that says there's no SD card, but I still hear it taking pictures. That's my thoughts behind it. So I always keep this off just so I never get that mixed up. And it just won't even let me take a picture if there's no SD card in the camera. All right, next up onto page number eight. So we're here, IS or image stabilizer mode. There's two different types of image stabilization in the Canon R10. So first of all is this one right here. This is for the lens stabilization. So if you have the kit lens or any other lens that has stabilization built into it or IS, which is what it says on the front of the lens, you can go ahead and turn this on and it'll use the in-lens stabilization. Overall, I would just keep that on all the time, honestly. It smooths out your photos so you can take longer exposure photos or so they don't look as shaky and you know blurry if you're moving around a lot. And in videos, it works too. It looks really good. I would always just keep this one on. And the next up, we have this one right here, which is digital image stabilization. This is actually only for video mode, so this does not affect photos at all. And so we're not gonna go over that in this video. This is just specifically for image quality. However, if you do wanna see a separate video about the video settings, go ahead and let me know in the comments below. Next up, customized quick controls. This is actually really more personal preference. The quick controls are these right here. So if you press this Q button, it's gonna be all these quick options you can just adjust on the fly without even having to go into the menu. I'm just gonna go ahead and skip over that. Next up, touch shutter. So what this actually does is allows you to take a picture just by touching the screen. So when you tap on whatever you wanna focus on, let's say I wanna focus on you know this over here. I'll tap that. As soon as it gets focused, it'll actually take the picture right after it gets focused without ever having to touch the shutter button. Personally, I kind of find it annoying and not super useful for what I do, so I disable it, but I could really see that being super useful for you know some types of situations. So definitely personal preference, I just personally keep it disabled. Next up, image review. This essentially lets the camera know if you wanna see the image on the screen right after you take it. So if I go ahead and turn this on to two seconds, every time I hit the shutter button and take a picture, that's the picture right there. It'll show up for two seconds. You just saw that, it just went away. So if you, I can set this to, you know, eight seconds, I can press hold. So now when I take a picture, this is the picture right here. This isn't, you know, you can't see my hand there. That's the picture. Now, if I like half press the shutter button, it'll go away. Now you can see my hand. Um, so yeah, I just kind of adjust those. Again, very personal preference. I actually usually just keep this off 
you know, if I want to look at a picture, I can just go and look at it there. So I personally keep that off, but that's very personal preference as well. Next up, metering timer. So we talked about metering a while back. This is kind of how often it refreshes the metering, how often it looks at the exposure to adjust it automatically. You know, the typical one is eight seconds and I've always just left it at that. All right, next up, display simulation. So set this at exposure plus depth of field. What this essentially does is when you're looking in the viewfinder and on the screen, um, it'll show you exactly what the image is going to look like in terms of exposure, in terms of depth of field, everything like that. And honestly, I would just set it at exposure plus depth of field all the time. I mean, you always want to see what your exposure is going to look like. So I just keep it on that 100% of the time and just leave it right there. And next up, OVF Simulation View Assist. I keep this off. If you turn it on, it'll kind of give you a more natural looking image, apparently. However, your exposure and your the look of the image is going to be different from when you take it. So if you keep this off, keep this on, you know, whatever your exposure is will be, you know, really similar to what the actual image is. Next up, shooting info display. This is kind of personal preference as well. This is all this stuff is going to be showing up, you know, the info button here, all the different options there for what you see in your display while you're taking photos or videos. Again, that's very personal preference. I'll let you adjust that kind of whatever you want to see on the screen at the time. Next up, reverse display. This has to do if it flips the image, you know, when you move your screen around. So when you flip your screen to be frontward facing, it'll essentially, if this is on, it'll flip the image to look more natural. And same thing with if your camera's upside down or if your screen is upside down or something like that. Um, if it's on, it'll automatically flip it to kind of best fit your shooting situation. If you turn it off, it'll stay exactly how it is, even if it's upside down or backwards or something like that. Next up, viewfinder display format. You can kind of see what these do right here. So this one is gonna be the most zoomed in full screen on your viewfinder. However, you might have to kind of move your eye around a little bit to see the corners and see the edges and stuff like that. This one is just a little bit more zoomed out, a little bit smaller, so you can kind of see more at once, you know, without having to like look around and move your eye around in the viewfinder. All right, next up is display performance. So there's two different options here, power saving, which will essentially lower the frames per second, the refresh rate on your screen. It'll look a little bit more choppy like when you move around. However, of course, it'll save more battery, you know, use a lot less battery power to the camera. And there's smooth, which will give you the highest frame rate. It'll look the smoothest and most realistic, you know, as possible, but it's gonna use a lot more battery, but I personally just leave it at that. I always have a bunch of extra batteries with me as it is. Um, so I just set mine to that to have the most realistic, best looking image on the screen. And last but not least, page 10 here. And these are actually all video settings. So again, if you wanna see a video settings tutorial for the best settings for video with the Canon R10, let me know down in the comments and I can do that as well. But that wraps up the best photo settings for the Canon R10. I really hope this video helped you out. If it did, please consider dropping a like and subscribing to my channel and I will see you in the next video.